Okay, um, so hi, I'm Alvin. I'm one of the video producers on Tasty. Um, any, you know, raise your hands, Have anybody know what Tasty is? Okay, a couple people. How many of you have seen a Tasty video on your Facebook timeline? Maybe you didn't share it, but your friends might have told you to make this with them. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, it's those one minute, really short cooking videos. It's square, it's top down, there's a lot of hands going in frame. Um, and so that's, I guess that's one of my, that's my job. I make Tasty videos and in case um, none of you have seen one. I just wanted to show a quick one so you guys get a sense of the kind of work we do here. So I made this one. It's called Chicken Parmesan Stuffed Garlic Bread, and this is what a tasty video is like. So yeah, that's a tasty video. Oh wow, applause. Never never got that before. So you know, um, 144 million views, not bad for you know something that was shot in about two hours right over there. Um, oh yeah, that's uh, our New York Tasty Kitchen. Guys, say hi, we rehearsed this. So they're working, slaving the night away, making videos just like this one. And um, basically today what I was gonna talk a little bit about is essentially a little bit about how we think about ideas and how we actually come up and with our ideas and how we think about food in general. So um, as Tasty, we're really focused on looking for audience engagement. You know, food is a very social, social thing. People connect over it. I've seen long lost friends just sort of tag each other on Facebook over a Tasty video. And they've literally not seen each other for six years, but something reminded them of each other and they, they you know, met up a weekend and like made the food. So I thought, you know, we in Tasty are looking for social connection, but we're also looking for uh, engagement on you know on such a massive scale we deal with about 77 million fans every single day and that's number is growing and you know with this with this large scale this massive amount of people that are looking at our content we really have to think about you know numbers and how they relate to food you know food is such a qualitative thing you can't really measure it or quantify it or at least that's what we thought in the beginning and to sort of play this game where we're making hundreds of videos and getting billions of impressions and millions of views we sort of asked ourselves, you know, can we even quantify? Can we even start to quantify what we're doing? Is it even possible? Are we just playing this game where we're just constantly making food without even knowing what we're doing? So one thing that we looked to do in the beginning was to answer this question, you know, can food be quantified? Can you compare cheese to chocolate and things like that? You know, can you, you know, find a correlation between chicken and dessert? Like, we didn't have an idea, but so we sort of set out to figure this out. And one thing that we started to think about to solve this question was, you know, we serve the internet. We are BuzzFeed, we are Tasty, we have millions of Americans at our fingertips, and we have to get them to share our videos. And what that means is we have to make content that they like. Obviously, you know, of course, that's what we have to do. But a big thing that we learned early on was thinking about perspective. You know, every single one of you in this room was raised by different parents in a different geography. We're eating, grew up eating different kinds of foods, you know, grew up liking different things based on your social, social circumstances. And, you know, as producers, we are one person thinking of an idea. We take the recipe, we create it, we shoot it, we cook it. And, you know, when we're one person, we, are, we have to acknowledge that we sometimes may be biased when it comes to making food videos that we're making for the mass internet. So one thing that we realized early on was that our perspective is extremely unique. And in order to get those people to share our videos, we really have to think about the internet as a whole and making our content for them. And you know, this led to us taking a step back and saying, okay, do I wanna make a peanut butter ramen chicken sandwich video because I like it or because you know, the audience likes it? I actually grew up eating peanut butter and ramen with chicken on the side. Don't ask, it's actually pretty good. Um, it sounds silly, but you know, what that means to us is that when we're thinking of a video idea and we say, I wanna do this video, you know, is it because I think the internet is gonna like this video? Or is it I wanna do this video because I think it's successful? 
And being able to make that distinction really helps us tailor content better for our audiences for every single video that we make. Um, and one thing that, you know, we're constantly coming up with ideas, you know, we post one to two tasty videos a day, and people ask us, you know, how do you not run out of ideas? And that was a very good question, because sometimes we'd be running low, and we'd literally just stare at the wall. We'd have these weird brainstorms, we went on Google, we went on Pinterest, we started searching keywords to try to scramble for ideas, and we realized that that wasn't efficient, because we weren't having a concrete strategy when it came to making these food videos. So what I wanted to do was, I wanted to literally have, let's say, a game I could play, and I would come out with a strategically positioned food idea that would perform successful on the internet. So I came up with these seven games, um, you know, the names are listed below, and the underlying concept behind each of these games is that you know, you're taking something familiar and you're making it new. So you're taking familiar food, turning it into a new food, or you're turning it into a new form, or you're taking a new food and making it familiar to people. So the first one is like mix and match. So what, you know, what this is is you take two things or two buzzwords when it comes to food, like mac and cheese and pizza, and you kind of mash them together and you make like a food hybrid. So like spinach dip and mozzarella sticks, you know, and mozzarella stick onion rings and chicken parmesan, garlic bread, like the one you just saw. Those were a direct result of us thinking like, okay, what sort of two things do people love and how can we put them together and which ones are not stupid? Because so many times we just think of stuff that it's like, oh, of course, bacon, mac and cheese, taco. That's amazing. No, that's a terrible idea. So it's really up to us to do the due diligence to think about you know, how we can actually make ideas that people want to share versus ones that are too crazy. So there's a really fine balance there. Um, the second one is uh, you take a meat and you take a vegetable and you take a cheese or a rich component and you kind of stuff it inside each other and you just get like a bunch of shares. Trust me, it works. Um, basically how this came about was I made spinach dip stuff inside chicken on accident once. I thought it was just a cool thing I saw on Pinterest and so many people shared it. I was like, this is insane. Why are people sharing this? People were making it for dinner, posting pictures and I was like, oh, chicken breast is the number one most popular cut of meat in America. And you know, obviously, you know, spicing up old chicken breast, it's a cool way to eat chicken in a new form. So I'm like, oh, can I do this with not just chicken? What about steak? So I made like steak rolls with spinach and provolone and mushrooms. So you got your vegetables, you got your cheese. Again, bunch of shares. Everybody was making it. I was like, whoa, this is like hacking almost. So I like made another one. It was fajita stuffed chicken, so it's chicken breast again, but red bell peppers, green bell peppers, and pepper jack cheese. And you know, got so many shares, I'm like, wow. Every time I want a viral video, I'll just go stuff some chicken. Um, and the third one is one pan or one pot comfort food. So it's a common or it's like a trendy or cool thing to cook things in just one pot or one pan because it saves time. You don't have to clean a bunch of stuff. You know, when you're cooking pasta, usually you boil it and then you drain the water and you put it back in some sort of sauce. You know, in one pot pastas that we do a lot, they're cooked in the sauce, they're cooked in milk, they're cooked in cream. So it kind of, it's, it's so easy for people to make at home. And one pan is when you, you, know, you bake everything on one pan for dinner, like chicken or salmon, along with the vegetables, so you get a dinner. So people are thinking, oh, that's so much easier to make. I'm just going to want to make this for dinner, and I'm going to share this because you know, this is something I would actually make. Um, and the fourth one is called Four Ways. I'm going to get into more depth on this in the next slide. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of information on that. And food in different form, you know, instead of taking you know, like, uh, chicken parmesan and mashing it up with another food like garlic bread, what we think about is, okay, let's pick a starting point whether it's chicken parmesan, whether it's Oreos, whether it's apple pie, and let's turn it into a different shape. You know, one of our earliest viral hits was pizza cone, where it was like pizza, but it was like in a cone shape, and somehow people thought that was really cool. It is pretty cool, um, because it was in a different form. It's like, it's so baffling to us. It's like, oh, it's like the same food you know, it's a different shape, and then everybody shares it. It's kind of like why you buy the new iPhone, you know, iPhone 6, iPhone 7, but it's a new thing, but it's not, it's the iPhone. Um, so there's something there that we sort of think about, you know, what, what food can we make into a cone? What can we turn into like a ball or a cup? Um, and the sixth one is foreign hybrid. So we take a food that we love in America, but is not necessarily from this country, like crepes, for example. I made a crepes four ways video, and crepes are originating from France, but by hybridizing them with American flavors like s'mores, uh, what was it, like Bananas Foster and Strawberry Cheesecake, which are all basically American things, we get shares from not both America, but also France as well. So that really gives us a number boost. And the last one is cloning, where we take a past successful Tasty video, like I think Scott, one of our producers here, made like this guacamole onion stuffed onion ring, and I saw that video, and I was like, that's genius, that's crazy, like onion rings are basically vessels for everything, what else can I stuff inside it? Oh, a cheeseburger, of course. So I made cheeseburger onion rings, and that did also really well. Um, so that's another strategy that, com that we can come up with. So um, if you haven't seen them, uh, the four ways is sort of a format that we really like to do 
because it's sort of one of our most highest shared formats. So the idea behind it is that we present one dish, a very familiar dish, a dish people love, and we, that is also like open to flavor interpretation, and we offer the viewers four different flavor variations on it. So up, up here, we have like puff pastries, four ways. The second one is like penne pasta, four ways. And the last one is sliders, four ways. You know, these are all dishes that we all kind of know, but are not limited to one single flavor. So when we provide four different flavors, people aren't getting mad that we're messing with a dish. And the concept behind this is that when we present the audience four chances to share the video, it's mathematically boosting the number of shares we will get. Because, you know, let's go through an example. Let's say I do s'mores brownies, but 20,000 people on our audience hate s'mores, absolutely hate it, will not share that video. Okay, so I lost 20,000 people from our shares, but if I do brownies four ways, and I still include s'mores brownies as the first one, but, and the 20,000 people see that, they're like, I don't like that. But maybe the third one is a caramel red velvet brownie, and they love that. Maybe I get 10,000 of those shares back. So even though they hate one of them, or maybe three of them, but they like at least one of the four, I will get them to share, and that sort of like has the biggest part of our audience sharing the video, which is why four ways is sort of like a format that we really like to do. I think the top tasty video of all time is like, you know, I think it's sliders four ways now to keep sharing for some reason. No idea why. Um, and one thing that when it comes to making tasty videos is that we don't just say, oh, I just wanna do it and let's put it out there and let's see what happens. We really don't like guessing and just like thinking about, oh, let's just hope it does well. We really want to break this down to as much of a science as we can because we're dealing with such scale. So we make videos and we really wanna think about theories that we're testing, theories that have already been tested by previous videos and sort of set expectations and realistic expectations for ourselves. You know, is my video going to hit 500,000 shares or am I aiming for three million, four million shares, like mega viral, like we have to be able to make that distinguish, we have to be able to distinguish that because that gives us a better sense of how well our audience will react to certain types of content. And after that, we sort of think about errors or potential risks that videos might carry. You know, the chicken parmesan stuffed garlic bread video, when I came up with that idea, I thought it was too crazy. I thought people might have been turned off by it because it was just too much and it was just, I thought it was more of a food stunt. So that was a risk that, carry, that was carried in the video. Um, luckily, people seem to like it a lot. And by, you know, thinking about, thinking about this in an analytical way and iterating constantly with ideas and numbers, theories and strategies and adjusting those theories as video gets published, we'll continually hone our sense of how a food video will perform on Facebook and doing this over time really helps us, you know, um, grow as producers kind of along this trend. So um, this is a very rough diagram of how we think we as Tasty Producers grow by making videos. As you can see, the dotted line is let's say, you know, 100% of our videos hit 500,000 shares. 500,000 shares is what we consider a successful Tasty video. That's obviously a line that represents something extremely idealistic and, you know, unrealistic because nobody's perfect and we test things sometimes. Um, but we really want to try to get there as close as possible. And to be fair, I can honestly say I started near the origin point there, pretty much zero, zero, maybe even negative, where none of my videos were doing well. But after you know, coming up with a strategy to think about tasty videos in such an analytical way, I cannot confidently say that over time I've been able to go and go grow constantly along that blue line and get closer and closer to 500,000. So you, know, you, you see tasty videos on the internet, you might think, oh, it's just a food video, someone's cooking at home, they're making a recipe for the internet, but there's actually a lot more uh, things in it that you might think. Yeah, that's it. Any questions? First of all, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> That's an interesting question. Um, I was actually not. Oh, uh, the question was how Tasty got started, and what was the second part of it? Um, I think Tasty was actually started in LA in the BuzzFeed office over there. A couple of creative geniuses just decided to play around with you know, food formats on the internet. So they actually didn't start by making the videos that you see today. They were like watermelon hacks or like ramen hacks or like pizza hacks. And they were shot totally different, you know, 16 by nine. And I think after making a bunch of those videos, they found enough signals from those videos to say, what if we did recipes? There's a huge library of recipes out there and they've never been done in such a condensed short form accessible 
format to the millennial audience, so they started playing around with that and developed the sort of production style that you know as Tasty today. I can't speak much to it because I was in New York when it happened. I got pulled onto it after it started, but I think once it started taking off, it like really took off. Yeah. For a Tasty? Uh, we have people from all walks of life. Um, I personally, um, I'm actually an, an industrial engineer. I was not culinarily trained. Um, I picked up a video camera two years ago. But we do have a really highly skilled team of chefs who have been trained you know, professionally by the culinary institutes who really help us you know, teach us about food and make sure that all the recipes that we're putting out are fitting the culinary standards. So even though we have audience, because part of our audience is the really you know, high end chef audience because they like watching our videos and we have to make sure that our videos will also fit into their standards as well because we really want to be accessible to as many people as we can. But in short, there's a lot of people with a lot of different backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, what do we do with all the food we make and do we deliver? So the first question, <laughs> um, so all the food that we make, if we don't take it home and if we don't eat it ourselves, it usually goes out to the rest of the office. There's like 500 people in this office and we have a Slack channel called Leftovers where we just say, you know, we have X and X dish on the 13th floor and I've never been in the upper or lower floors when it happens, but apparently, you know, chairs get pushed over, people are fighting, stairs, people are not running, but they are running because they don't run, they might miss it. And I think I timed it once. I made 24 cookies and I timed it and when I send out the message, the time that all the cookies were gone was about one minute and 28 seconds. So the food gets eaten very, very quickly, or else it gets taken home, and no, we don't deliver, but if, you know, if you're like on one of the other floors, you might walk up the food to you. Cool, thank you. <laughs> 